Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. John, he um, he doesn't look terribly much like a six-time world champion and two-time Olympic gold medalist, just from if you give him the eye test. Mm -hmm. And so um, you might be mistaken if you think that he's not very strong. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is Ryan Warner, your host. Folks, today our guest is the great Kendall Cross, 1996 Olympic gold medalist. He was an NCAA champ and a three-time All-American for Oklahoma State. Awesome, awesome interview here. As you can imagine, this was shot as part of the research phase for the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and USA Wrestling's Etched in Stone series, which will feature the Smiths this January. So this conversation is pretty heavily focused on Kendall's time at Oklahoma State during the Smith era. I'd love to have Kendall back on and talk about his career, but I just want to preface that it's done with the angle of the Smiths. Fan of the week goes to my man, NYC Performer 94. He's a graduate student at Hunter College, a diehard wrestling fan. Thank you very much for the love and support. And folks, if you want to support the podcast, please go to our online store. That's store.wrestlingchangemylife.com. We have t-shirts, hoodies, crew neck stickers, ton of good stuff. Store.wrestlingchangemylife.com. That's it, ladies and gents. Let's get to the interview with Kendall Cross. And from what I read, it all started with Don Langham. What did you learn from uh, Coach Langham back in the day? Oh, wow. You know about Coach Langham. All right. Yeah. Well, um, it, my high school coach, Don Langham, he was uh, an amazing, he wrestled at Central State, Oklahoma, what's now UCO. Um, and he was an amazing leg rider. And so at an early age, uh, in my junior high years, um, I was able to be around the guy and he, he actually coached the junior high team and then was promoted to the high school team um, right as I was going into high school. So I had him for all my junior high years and my high school years. And so I knew leg riding inside and out. I'd been on the boat, the bad end and the good end of uh, the best leg riding around. And um, so that's uh yeah, Don Langs has a special place in my heart because I, I think I used Legs, um, you know, leg riders are feared. And so I was one of those guys. Um, and it, it got me out of a lot of trouble. It made my opponents choose neutral in, in the second or third. And, um, you know, so it was, a, it was a blessing just to, uh, you know, by birthright to be around uh, Coach Langham. Man, I, I had no idea that that's where it all started and that he kind of went with you through each of those years. Yeah, you know, one thing that's been really cool just about – um, my progression was that um, I had a coaches for a long period of time and thankfully good coaches, um, you know, through, so I had a one coach from seventh grade year all the way to my 12th grade year and the consistency uh, it's important, you know, some oftentimes here in the United States, our model to develop kids is, you know, you have a junior high coach and you change to a high school coach and you change to a college coach. And then even further, you, uh, you get out of college and you have a new coach, you know, and um, through, so I had the same coach junior high to high school and then the same coach um, college 
to international, which is Joe C and Bruce Burnett. You know, um, Joe, Joe C and Bruce Burnett, Joe was the head, head coach. Bruce was the assistant through all of my college years at Oklahoma State. And then when I um, graduated and went on to international style of wrestling, well, Joe C was appointed the um, head Olympic team coach in 96. And Bruce Burnett, through those two Olympics that I was in, 92 and 96, was the uh, national team's coach. And so that okay. consistency was uh, it, it's pretty cool. And, I mean, on top of that, the guys that were in the room at that time, you know, Oklahoma State had some incredible teams in the late 80s and early 90s. They did, yeah. And, again, just by, uh, by birthright, I happened to be in, in the room with, uh, you know, quite honestly, um, some of the best wrestlers in the world. And, you know, you can, you can say that about John Smith, you know, and Kenny Monday. And there are others. It's, there's a plethora of guys that came through there during that time that uh, were just amazing wrestlers. And before we get to John and, and Kenny in that era, I'd love to hear a little bit about Coach C because, you know, he came into Okie State in the, in the early 80s, not well-liked because people loved Chesbro. And so he had a, a tough start, and he really created a great thing there. What do you remember about Coach C? And well, what I remember about Joe is, uh, and we call him Joe, I love that too. Okay. You know, I, um, I was uh, intimate with my coaches um, on and off the mat. We, you know, had dinner together. We, you know, um, just really had a very strong relationship. And um, so, you know, Joe did come in and have a rough patch because they, you know, Oklahoma State fired or pushed out uh, <laughs> Tommy Chesbro, who was, you know, the year before, you, you, I'm sure you know this. He was the um, coach of the year, you know, the Coaches Association, NWCA, whatever, coaches of the year. And they were second in the NCAAs. And I want to say that they had about six or seven shutouts, dual shutouts in that last year of his. And they let him go. And it was purely because um, Oklahoma State needed to be winning national titles instead of getting second. It was, it was, yeah. And so there was in this Chesbro uh, group, you know, this Ch Chesbro people and then Joe C people. And there weren't many Joe C people. <laughs> no water. And, uh, but, uh, and, and so, you know, he, he did have some adjustment, but he adjusted, man. We, we uh, won two NCAA titles my junior and senior year. And I want to say that it was his fifth, fourth and fifth or fifth and sixth year on the job. Can't remember exactly. Yeah. And um, so they got what they wanted. Oklahoma State got what they wanted. Two national titles after a 17-year drought, and everybody was happy. You know. But about about Joe, Ryan, I would say what he, you know, he's uh, he's a great coach. But I, I think his genius though, his genius was that he didn't have a, an ego so much to the degree that he didn't mind other coaches being involved with his athletes and just saying, Hey, you know, um, if he, if he gets better, everything's fine. And so he was just egoless and um, didn't need to take the credit. And we had a lot of coaches and, and also just, you know, peers that um, had an influence on everybody in the room. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a uh, workshop. You know, our practices were workshop. They could go off into tangents and different directions that maybe weren't planned, but it was just best for the group. And um, so I was a product of that. And uh, so it was, uh, I was really glad to be around Joe and, 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 you know, Bruce Burnett, you know, Bruce being his assistant at the time. And, um, but I would say that, you know, to nutshell Joe, I would say he was um, an egoless, selfless coach that just gave everything he had. He lived and loved wrestling, you know? Mm. And it's like he, what he could have done had some of those to me, ridiculous infractions not have been investigated so thoroughly. He would have been at the helm for a long time. And, you know, who knows what would have transpired with how many more years John would have wrestled if all that hadn't taken place. Yes. Uh, you know, um, we were getting ready to win. We were getting ready to reel off some titles we had some amazing guys just, uh, you know, waiting to get, waiting to, uh, in the red shirt and waiting to get on the mat. And, you know, we had 
guys that were transferring out of Oklahoma State and going and being All-Americans at Cal State Bakersfield and Fullerton and different places, we were seriously loaded. And then, uh, you know, the wheels came off. And understandably so, you know. Yeah, I mean, that story you're referencing uh, when McAllister went to Cal State Bakersfield after Pat beat him off. And then, lo and behold, at the quarters, Dan Russell has to beat McAllister to even get to Pat Smith. It's like there was so many, uh, there's just so many connections. But yeah, those teams uh, were just absolutely loaded. Where did Iowa stand in terms of the, the bullseye target back in those days? Well, my freshman year, they were trying to win their 10th title and I remember it very well because they uh, all had that year that team had a a Roman numeral X on their singlets um, and were uh, prepped to win their 10th team title you know and so that was significant you know I think that you know and from what I you know from the stories that I hear even Gable talking about it um, you know that was it was almost like a they didn't quite have the team to get it done. And that turned out to be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's almost like, um, wow, be careful what you put on your singlet. <laughs> Not that that truly had any effect on it, but you know. No, for sure. That, that was what they were trying to do. They were, I mean, I, you know, through my junior high and high school years, it was all Iowa. They were winning t- the NCAAs. You know, it was a, a running joke. Um, you know, you remember um, – Sandy, the announcer, Sandy, uh, Stevens, Sandy Stevens, Sandy Stevens would always, you know, throw in the team scores. I don't know, just throughout the tournament. And I just remember hearing and in first place with 13,000 points, Iowa, you know, (laughs) and, uh, I mean, it wasn't 13,000, but they were way ahead. And, uh, so, you know, that's kind of what I came into as a true freshman, I didn't redshirt, and my opponent at Iowa at the time was um, Brad Penrith. Oof. It was, uh, yeah. He's the man. I actually, man. Drew, him, I actually <laughs> drew him first round at the NCAA as my true freshman year. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. You have to tell the story about your first match against um, Bill Kelly when you're in the basement and Joe C. comes up to you. Um, share that story before we shift over to John and Pat, if you're, if you could. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, well, you know, I was getting, I it was my first, um, match for Oklahoma state. First time to put on that orange singlet, you know, something I'd always wanted to do, you know, is you're just something that was, you know, out there. So I'm like, gosh, wrestle for Oklahoma state, that kind of thing. And, um, it was against Bill Kelly. He was, eventually that year won the NCAA title. Uh, and, and he was, I want to say he was ranked second at the time and literally my first match in Gallagher hall. Uh, it was, uh, it was like, there was like an ice storm outside. And so all the students, you know, with nothing to do came to the match. They do anyway, but it just was an unusually loud, lo- large crowd that night. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I stayed downstairs because the crowd just wasn't used to it. And um, he came down. I said, you know, he can't, the, the agreement was come down and let me know. Come, just last minute, come get me. And so he comes down there and um, we're getting ready to walk up. And I, I remember looking at him and looking him in the eyes saying, hey, man, Joe, um, think I can beat this guy? <laughs> and uh, he gives me, he gives me this look like, uh, like but like absolutely no confidence. Like almost like. Um, yeah, yeah, let's go, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and, uh, I'll never forget it. It was, it was a cool moment. Um, I, he, he gave me zero confidence in the, in his, in the look that he gave me, you know, but at least it was honest and, you know, squeaked it out, beat the dude six, five. Did you? I never knew how the, how the match went. I beat him six, five. Yeah. Dude, how much difference in, like, strength and physical maturity was there in that match? Wasn't he, like, 26, 25? Sure. He had a mustache. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I still can't grow a mustache. You know, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was a man against boy. You know, I think my, my voice had just changed the year before, you know. So not only was I, just, you know, 18 years old, but um, I was really physically immature all, all through 
growing up. You know, I was just a late, uh, I came late, you know, and um, so, you know, that, that turned out to be not such a bad thing once I did, you know, get into my man strength. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I was late. So running into a guy like that who, you know, starting to bald, had a mustache. It's funny, the, the stuff that bothers you when you're a teenager. Right. You know? Psych yourself out for sure. Yeah, yeah. So once you were in the OSU lineup, I've, uh, I watched a video when you were inducted into one of the Hall of Fames where you said you always had trouble with cutting weight. And one time, it was like 11 o'clock, you went down to cut weight in, like, in the distance, like in a, some kind of like the shadow of the wrestling room. You see John doing stance of motion. Um, what happened there? Well, that would happen um, periodically. It would, it, would, it would not be uncommon to go down there late at night and John would be working out at the far end of the room, just shadow drilling. You know, one thing that, that John, uh, that he had to do a lot of because of his style was movement. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so he would uh, on his own, you know, uh, go down, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, go down to the basement and where, you know, our room was in a basement at Oklahoma state. And so he, he would be down there just uh, moving around, shadow drilling, you know, trying to tap into his cardio by himself. And, um, you know, I thought that was a neat thing. It's something that has always stuck with me because he didn't have to be down there. And I don't even know that it's terribly productive to be doing that at 11 o'clock tonight, at night. But, you know, for him, it was up here. And uh, so it was. It was, you know, for him, it could be productive. He, he uh put the time in and, you know, this was a, it was, it, so it was, you know, just having, having, being able to see that, that stuck with me in, in my own ways. You know, it's not necessarily what you're doing when everybody's watching, but what you're doing when nobody's watching, you know, kind of one of those things. And I was going to ask you, why do you think he did it, you know, so late at night when he didn't have to? You know, John would do that. He would, uh, um, you know, maybe just uh, – I think it would be a mental game for him. Uh, going back when nobody else is working out, mm-hmm. um, who, who in the country, who in the world at 11 o'clock at night um, would be doing something to get better. And, um, you know, one thing about John in particular, um, his confidence level was really through the roof. It's, it's almost to a level of disrespect. He just didn't believe anybody could beat him. And so to give them that kind of respect that they might be able to, I don't think it really, he, he drove himself to the point where that level of respect for an opponent, it didn't occur to him or he just didn't let it happen. You know, he, um, he just always had that attitude about him that he was just going to win. Who could beat him? I think that's what he thought. Who, who can beat me? You know, and um, maybe that's why he, went and worked out at 11 o'clock if I, if I saw it you know three times over the course of a of a folk style season um maybe it happened i don't know 30 times over the course of a folk style season i don't know but he did yeah. it and how did that kind of irreverence for his opponents transfer to how he would treat his training partners in a in a particular workout <laughs> it, you know what uh, John was brutal because he um, had to have points. He had to be the one to score, um, would get upset if you scored, and, um, and he wouldn't be, uh, you know, out of bounds to uh, tweak a knee um, to get to a finish and score in practice. There was just no let off, you know, no letting off. And so I um, it was a, a victim of, of many times of, just a, a little bit of a mean this or that, um, a, you know, a pull on the ankle against the joint to the knee. And um, why? Because he had to score. You know. He took it that personal even in a workout. He was pretty serious. It was pretty serious. You know, um, John and I, was, it, was, it was cool for me because um, I wasn't uh, near his level. You know, when, he, when I came in in my freshman year, John had just won the uh, – Goodwill Games in Moscow and beat, I want to say, Sarkeesian in the finals. And he, that was really 
that was right at the start of him of being him being John Smith. You know, it mm-hmm. hadn't really happened yet. And I come in and um his level was so high relative to the rest of ours, you know, the college kids. You know, he had two years of college left. He was a junior, I was a freshman, and um I remember, you know, what would happen with me and him is because of my style, um, I could, you know, catch him here and there, just, you know, maybe not, uh, you know, catch him sleeping and, and step over something and, or reach back on something. And so he would, uh, he would, he would pick me a lot because it would be something different and not straightforward. And, um, so because of that, but just because of my style, um, you know, I turned out to be a, a, a frequent training partner for him. And how, how often do you think you guys worked out over the years? Oh man. Well, I was with him from my freshman year all the way through to the 92 Olympics. So six years, because that was when he, that was, uh, I wouldn't, I don't even know how to put a number on it. I wasn't like, it wasn't every day, every day, but it was often. And, um, you know, the, the thing about it was it wasn't terribly fun um, to to work out with him because he was a little bit stingy on his drills. <laughs> he did, he Alan did, Freed said that last week. I was with him. He's like, John literally might drill on you 10 times in a row before he gives you one. Yeah, you got to say something. You got to say something. Like, hey, it's my turn. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, okay. He, he's he cordial about it, you know. Like, But if you let him, he'll um, take his, you know, 22 shots and then turn it over to you. You know, the way I look at it, he, he, um, he drilled um, paying attention to time versus paying attention to how many times he shot, you know? It wasn't three and three, it was, you know, it wasn't two and two. It was, I'm drilling, you're drilling. I'm drilling, you're drilling. You know, and it would escalate into to a bit of a spar. You know, that was typically the way it happened. Unless he was working on a specific thing. He, if he was working on a specific, a specific position, man, we could just be in there over and over again and you uh, just um, react and respond. But he's working on it. And the crazy thing that I found was that his friend Jerry Hickman would let him drill without any return shots for hours and hours on end. Yeah, well, Jerry, he wasn't wrestling, you know. And Jerry loved John. You know, that was his boy. They were very good friends, and, and um, <laughs> Jerry Hickman, I'm, I believe it. I believe it. I, Jerry, I bet he, you know, Jerry Hickman putting on a pair of shorts and a singlet and, or a pair of shorts and T-shirt and wrestling shoes. So he was, I want to say that Jerry was um, um, kind of an equipment manager, like, thing. Is that Is right? That, you know that? Yeah. I, so that's what I hear. It's, you can't get a straight story from anyone. Mark Perry Sr. says – he was never even on the team. John Smith says he worked out with him every day. I can't get a straight story on this guy. So I, I, I'm talking to him in a couple of weeks. Okay, who said what? So Mark, Mark, Mark Perry Mark Sr., Perry? he's uh-huh. like, Jerry Hickman wasn't even on the team. And right, then, and then John said I worked out, worked out with him every day. Every day. <laughs> I, would go with, I would go with Mark Perry. Okay. I don't think he was on the team. I think maybe, you know, he, uh, yeah, he, man, I want to say he was, doing our doing our equipment what what doing laundry but he was good dude jerry hickman was good um he had a a really um a stellar you know uh pre-college career you know he was good he knew what he's doing but i think he bowed that bowed out you know in terms of wrestling for okie state i don't remember that he was on the team not when i was there and john would just work out with him and so i I just think I hear all you guys telling me how he wouldn't let the other person drill, but then he had this other guy where Jerry never drilled. And, you know, I'm trying to convey to some of the listeners of the documentary, just how rare that is to get drilled on for hours without return. It, I couldn't think of it. Yeah. Any yeah. That, you know, yeah. And, and, you know, John knew that uh, Jerry would allow for that. Maybe, you know, it's all really, it's easy to presume <laughs> that um, or assume that he, uh, just uh you know we chose Gary, you know jerry and him are buddies and he knew that you know jerry knew what he was doing he could he, he wrestled mm-hmm. and uh so yeah to i don't doubt that what do you remember about john and randy wrestling in 88 
do you have any memories of those matches? I do. Um, you know, it was, it was such a conflict of styles. I think that was the biggest thing when you say John and Randy and, you know, um, it was such a, you know, the backstory too with Leroy Smith, you know, Leroy, um, the Olympic debacle, whatever you want to call it, you know, in, in 84 and Leroy, um, you know, having it going to court and Leroy gets taken. I want I want I don't want to say taken off the team, but I was just about that. I want to mm-hmm. say that Leroy was had the spot, and they it was they protested, and you know you know the story. Mm-hmm. And um, so there's that, and then you know um, the next the very next uh, quad. He John is wrestling him, and that's an interesting take. You know, and, and, then, and then on top of it, the serious conflict of styles where you've got the pot, or arguably the best low level shooter in the world, and then arguably the best counter wrestler in the world. And what's going to happen? What's it going to look like? You know, and so um, that was, uh, that's what I remember about it. You know, John stayed out of his, you know, he, he, Randy could throw. Randy had a, he was dangerous as well as defensive. And, you know, I think that, you, you know, he's a bit of a wild card with what you're going to get when, whenever you connect or shoot, you know, whatever, whatever position it is, you don't exactly know what he's going to do. It's not, ob- not often the same thing every time. And, you know, John, what I remember about this match is we used to, man, he managed them, managed mm-hmm. them, you know, and they had, they did have their, you know, John had confidence in his shots and got you know, burned a couple of times through crotch lift stuff. And, but he managed it in terms of just making sure they did what he had to do to make the team. It was, it was cool. It was cool to see him train for it and then do it and come back and talk about it, you know? So. And was there that, that cloud of 1984, was it noticeable when they were wrestling in Topeka and Pensacola? I don't think so. I think it was really, man, it, you know, just in, in my, uh, you know, from, from my viewpoint, you know, there was, if that was kind of the, the backstory. It was, you know, it was in the back of your mind. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think it was just about John Smith and Randy Lewis, the, uh, the competitors, the style conflicts, and who's going to win. And you got a feeling that both of those guys – could easily be the Olympic champ going into the 88 Olympics. Yeah, it's, it's safe to say. I mean, you had the returning Olympic champion. And, uh, yeah, that was I, – I, you know, honestly, I, I couldn't really see Randy winning, beating John. You know, was, he was – of course, I was around John every day. So, you know, you build confidence in your teammates too, right? Mm-hmm. And, but, yeah, either one of them. I mean, and Randy had cut so much weight down, and it was fun hearing him talk about those. I mean, they wrestled five times in a matter of, like, two months. Um, but then in 88, you know, John beat Sarkissian. You know, in, inside the Oklahoma State Room, you mentioned how dominant John was and kind of his presence. After he won the Olympics in 88, how would you describe kind of his rise in popularity within the wrestling community? Yeah, after 88, I mean, they, that was where – that was kind of – you know, 86, he won the uh, Goodwill Games. 87, he won the Worlds. Um, 88 was the Olympics. And, you know, he, that's, that's your, your coming out song, you know. Um, that's where, you know, he, uh, he came back. He and Kenny, you know, came back the heroes, man. And um, right in the middle, in, in, right amongst all of us guys that were wanting to be that, you know, it was, um, it was pretty, it was, it was amazing to just see it happen. And what I mean by seeing it happen was, um, you know, I watched him um, train and compete in college. And then he, you know, graduates and continues to train and compete. And his progression and where he went with it and the different kinds of uh, technical stuff that he would kind of phase in and out of. Sometimes it's high C stuff. Sometimes it's low single. Um, and um, so it was really a, it was a cool thing to see how it was done, you know, with he and Kenny, see how it was done with my own eyes, how they train. 
and the mistakes that they would make and the, the great practices they would have, the bad practices, um, and then they go and win. And so I'm, you know, as one of the guys there, I got to see all that go down and make sense of it and, and say to myself, ah, I see how it's done. And it's not this, this big out there, too far out to reach, you know, star in the sky kind of thing. It was, um, oh, I can do this. I see it. I see how they did it. And it made it possible for me. You know, I'm sure a, a lot of others too, you know, just, it made it seem possible that uh, I can do it. It demystified the whole process. That is got to be such a relief to see someone doing it. And you talk about their work ethic and I've, I've read stories where you said him and Kenny were just animals. I mean, <coughs> it's not the same kind of work ethic as an Iowa, a Tom and Terry brands, but how would it, how is it different and unique than kind of how Iowa guys would do it just in your mind? In my mind, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't know how Iowa guys, um, you know, how their workouts were. I, I, there was a, have you, I, there was a good description between the two programs that Ray Brinzer made. Yes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Kind of. So Go ahead. Ray Brinzer, he, cause he, he, Ray Brinzer wrestled at both, um, in both programs. And so, and he, he's smart, very introspective and, and, um, his take was, and we all knew it, but it, it was just so well put. He was like, you know, um, at Oklahoma State, if it doesn't work, you change it. At Iowa, if it doesn't work, you do it harder. <laughs> it's such a description, it's such a good description, you know. Um, but I would say just, uh, well, I'll tell you what our practice rooms, rooms were like. I mentioned it, I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but it was workshop. It was uh, going over a position, you know, going, dealing with a position and it'd be over a couple of days. It wouldn't necessarily, and some days there would be we would go over three or four positions or, you know, this tactical stuff. And um, it was all included, you know, whoever's working on, you know, position and technique, you know, we all gravitated to um, the techniques that worked. And, you know, John happened to be at the forefront of a lot of techniques that were working at the time. You know, Kenny was pretty, uh, he was a unique animal because he was just such an athlete and, and powerful. And, um, you know, not too many of us um, are dropping lateral drops on the best wrestlers in the world. <laughs> right? So Seriously. it's funny, you know, I think Kenny won for very different reasons than John won. We had them both in the room too, you know, and taken from both. But, you know, one, one thing, one commonality that they did have is, um, they were seriously committed to their training and, um, proud about it. Um, hungry, just all those things, all those intangibles. You know. And you talk about one of the reasons John won was he was just constantly evolving. And, you know, I've seen him hit more of those elbow to the high C versus the, the low single, but the low single kept people at bay. And then he also had that snap down for all those years. And then he got nasty on top. And so the progression was incredible. Take, take the listener inside of what it felt like to go with John a couple of takedowns. Was it, you know, a real physical thing? Was he faint and moving? I mean, what was that experience like? No, John, um, wrestling John, um, a lot of times you would not get tired because it would be a shot to a finish done. You back up, shot, finish, done. You know, and if, it were, if you were working top bottom, he'd turn you first. And so there weren't these big scrambles because he just subdued the position. He knew position very well. He just knew every, every position in and out. And um, so one, you know, it, it's not a, an exhausting thing to, to, you know, it doesn't, you're not exhausted having a, you know, a 45 minute workout with him, which might include, you know, warm out, warm up, uh, drill, kind of flow into, a, you know, beyond drilling and then go live goes. Um, if I would say this, you know, you, uh, John, he, um, he's not, he doesn't look terribly much like a six time world champion and two time Olympic gold medalist, just from, if you give him the eye test. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you might be mistaken if you think that he's not very strong because what would happen is, you know, you could shoot into his hips, you know, shoot to his hips, shoot to his legs. 
and you would get his hips. Just um, he had his his, um, his hip strength. Just the way he was able to to leverage um, his weight um, and his strength. He was strong, but just the way he would put his hips into you, um, it was it was like hitting a brick wall, you know, to shoot in on it, and you wouldn't think. But he just, uh, he, th- there's timing to it. There's when you, when you put your hips into it that he shoots, you know, so there's all that. And man, he had it all. And then another thing that was really amazing about him was when he would drop, you know, change levels and, and come into you on to a high C or even a single. And, you know, we'll talk about a high C first. He could, you know, pass an elbow, duck to a high C and, go right to the the mat with his butt and his feet would be sticking out to the side right so it's like a like a little kid like a baby how you know their flexibility is freakish right so he could sit down and have his feet out to the side and because of his core strength he had so much strength when he was down there Hmm. you know his strength wasn't really compromised just because he was super low sitting on his butt with his feet out and um, so you felt him there too. You, you know, trying to use your hips on a shot of his, and he would meet you halfway. And it was just a, he was really a, it was an amazing experience. With all that being said, how much of a shock was it? And this is kind of an obvious question and, and a novice question, but how much of a shock was it when he lost the match one at John Fisher? Yeah, I, I um, that, that was a, him losing to John, yeah, that was I didn't wasn't something I thought would ever happen. You know, as far as the the field in the U.S., you know, John Fisher, he and I became very good friends because we were always running second. To you know, I was behind Brands, and John was behind John Fisher was behind John. You know, so we actually kind of connected on a level, and um, loved the dude. Um, but I did never think he'd beat John. You know, and um, you know, I, I it, it actually. After the match, it was one of the first times that I'd ever really um, saw, saw fear in, in John. Like he, uh, you know, it, there were some weird circumstances leading up to it, if, if, you, if, if you will. Um, you know, that going into that Olympic year, USA Wrestling set up a, a, um, a model for the number one guys to be able to make that Olympic team. The number one guys from the 91 team they basically had it set up where you make the 91 team and they told us before 91, you make the 91 team, you're guaranteed a two out of three in 92 Olympic trial. And I think that what happened was those guys that made that team in 91, they didn't have to, to uh, compete as much and, you know, compete as much, you know? And so, you know, John, if you look at, you know, his successes, man, he was, he did compete a lot. He, he did wrestle. And I, um, you know, I just wonder that, you know, going into that 92 year, John Smith wasn't the, just the battle worn, ready to go. Um, John Smith that he normally would be having had to do the nationals, he did open the trials. Um, I think the whole, that whole group of guys from 91, um, th- th- their trials, their final trial, they weren't all, it was a little bit lackluster. Mm. You know? And then you compound the fact of him coaching all year too, and then having that staff infection at the end, it's like just a perfect storm. It was, I remember he had hair falling out, you know, that, you know, that could have had to done the pressure of making this, you know, he, so he wins um, that he makes that team and goes to the Olympics. He's, you know, well, he, he's six time world champion and Olympic champion. Right. And, um, yeah, he was, he was, he had the infection thing where his, you know, he was, you know, losing his hair was thinning. He was, you know, just a unhealthy going into it, you know? And, um, so I know that, uh, there were a lot of factors and not, I was going to say, not the least of which, which Fisher just wrestled his ass off and you know, you watch those matches. He, he did. He he, he did. John Fisher wrestled, wrestled his ass off. And, and um, you know, you got to give him that. You know, it's, it's what a shame that John Fisher came through with John Smith. Because, man, he, man he, could, he, was, he was doing damage overseas. I've been on a couple tours with him, and he's, he's kicking 
he's kicking some butt, man. Dude was good. So, but couldn't get out of the country. Couldn't, couldn't see a world, world championship, you know? And, and, and when you say you sense fear in John's face, was it fear that he could lose or that he wasn't the same person he was? I think it was just maybe um, his condition right then. Mm. Like maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was, I was, uh, in 92, I was, I remember being in a hotel and I was, I was um, juicing a lot. I was, uh, you know, running fruit and vegetables through this, you know, this grinder. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I remember taking it into his hotel room and sitting with him in between those, the, those matches. And, um, you know, I just, uh, you know, at maybe just the, uh, the situation he had just lost, he wanted, it was this, you know, the first one. And I remember thinking, you know, that I just the normal, super confident John Smith that I was used to be around. Um, there was a little bit of, uh, and it wasn't just what he said. I don't think it was anything that he said. I think it was his body language and look, you know, like, Ooh, you know, I just, uh, I sensed that he was, um, super anxious about what the next thing to do would be. You know, he managed it, he, he, you know, he's John Smith. But um, it was, uh, I, yeah, you know, I think everybody has their, in their own minds, they, they have their weaknesses. And um, I think that was, a, it was an interesting moment. I could have misread it, you know, maybe, maybe he was fine, but. I don't know, I mean, you gotta trust your gut and I, that sounds reminiscent with what I've heard from his brother-in-law, Chuck White, um, that he was just like kind of despondent afterwards. And it reminds me of how in 96, when you had dropped the first one and Joe C came up to you and said, you still got to win too. Um, kind of reminds me of that scenario. Yeah. You know, I, um, yeah, John came back and did what he had to do. It, it uh, you know, and rightly so, man, you know, it's, it's his last one, but, you know, maybe he came back and, you know, had those thoughts, you know, he had that, the infection, um, wasn't terribly, um, he just wasn't full on healthy right there. And, and then had to make a team while not being hundred mm -hmm. you know? percent and then, and then losing the first match. And then what does it go through? You know, I know how it works on me. So you, you start thinking of all the, all the bad stuff that, Oh my gosh, you know, I, I didn't do that. I didn't do this. And I've been there and, uh, you know, I'm sure that that played on him. For sure. And I, I wish we had more, I have to jump in 15, but, um, and maybe we can revisit Pat later, but I got to ask you uh, two Pat stories. If you have another 15. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about your reaction when you heard that Pat was going to come in the lineup as a true freshman. Well, Okay, Pat coming in as a true freshman, you know, it's tough because, you know, I, it was, um, was it my senior year? Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he was in practice. He, he was pretty much managing everybody, and it's, you know, especially the dudes at his weight. And, um, McAllister at the time, I wouldn't say he was struggling, but man, it was just, it was just this big, there was so much momentum in Pat's direction. And what do you do with that? Do you let Jeff McAllister finish out his senior year? Or do you kind of go with your gut on Pat Smith, make, you know, doing the job at the NCAAs? And, um, they, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know how to say it. I don't know. You know, one thing that, that I think that we all knew was, you know, Pat just believed that he was just better than everybody. You know, he kind of, he took this whole John Smith thing that John created. And because he's his little brother, he's like, I'm Pat Smith. Who's going to beat me? You know, he didn't even think about it. And so there was that, that um, confidence that he had just thinking that, you know, nobody's, you know, he had, he had some ugly losses early that year, like, oh, my gosh. But his, his progression was so steep. Um, and then by the time that it came to have, to have to actually make a decision on who to go with, um, you know, they went with Pat. So I wasn't terribly surprised as a teammate 
Hmm. I was sad for Jeff. Nah, he, you know, we were good friends. He lived down the street from me. We, you know, one thing about those teams that those two teams that won, we were really close. We we go to the movies together. We hang out and go to dinner. And our girlfriends knew each other. Um, we were a really tight knit group. And you know, Jeff McAllister was part of that. And um, so it was it was a bummer right? yeah. because we were so close. But I think it was, <laughs> turned out to be the right thing. He still got a he still got on the podium, which. I mean, I believe you placed that year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did. Okay. Good. Good. Um, you mentioned uh, Pat had an ugly loss. Did you make the trip to Portland State for the Dan Russell? I did not. Year? You did. I did not okay. go to that. I did not go. It was early. It was like really right off the bat, wasn't it? It was like yeah, November or something. And it's like of all people to have for your first match, you have a guy who's a four-time D two champ. It's just you know, I this... know. And yeah, I want to say yeah. I, I remember it not being so pretty. Like at all, Pinned like oh my gosh, in a second. you know, because I think everybody had these expectations of what Pat was going to be because he's John's brother, and then boom, you know, they're welcome to college, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but he ironed that out so quick. You know, one thing, one of the things I love about Pat was um, his his level of uh, his mindset. He 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 worked on his skills. His his skill sets was it was really a low single, right? He did have elbow pass too you know, all the same stuff and, and very reminiscent of John. Um, but one thing, I don't know if this is a knock or not, but Pat Smith, he didn't, um, he didn't let himself think about the possibility of somebody being better than him. Didn't, didn't occur. Didn't occur to him. Nobody's better. I'm, I'm Pat Smith. I'm going to win. Not you. Done. That's, that's as far as maybe the thinking went for him, in my opinion. <laughs> You know, the dude just uh, didn't analyze um, the possibilities and went out there and won the NCAAs again and again and again, you know. Well, what's unique about Pat is he has a, a way to turn things that would otherwise be negative and reframe them as a positive. And here's what I mean. He said after he got pinned by Dan Russell, he came back. And he's battling with Chris Barnes every day. And he said that Chris Barnes would take him down 25 times to two. But Pat looked at those two takedowns as a positive. And so he kind of reframed that, to your point, to never letting his, his confidence down. I mean, talk about Chris Barnes a little bit. Yeah, Chris Barnes. Um, well, yeah, I, 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 I can guarantee you that will happen in practice because Chris Barnes never got taken down, what, his senior year and maybe once or twice his junior year. You know? Wow. Um, yeah, he was. It, it, it's funny, you know, Chris. I wish he'd gone on to con, con, continue to compete and really, uh, you know, put effort into that because you know we would all know him right now. Um, but I, you know, I just I even you know some people my age are like Chris Barnes. I don't, I don't know. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? You're one of the greatest ever. You, oh, 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 outstanding wrestler, you know, at the NCAA's. And um, again, he was another one that was just a uh, in the practice room. It's an amazing asset for all of us. You know, how much did Chris help Pat? I would imagine a ton, you know? A lot. Yeah. yeah. And I got to say, I'm the same way. I had no idea who Chris Barnes was until this documentary. And now I'm looking back like, geez, what a mistake that was. Because, I mean, not getting taken down over that many seasons and the schedule you guys wrestled back then, that's saying a lot. Yeah, he was really uh, – and he also – he was just amazing. Um, his his, his – um, on paper, he's amazing, uh, and you wouldn't. And he's a, and again another one of those guys. And it was cool that you know he ended up being at Oklahoma State because he just fit into the style of wrestling that was happening at the time. You know, he's long, uh, flexible. Uh, he's a thinker. Um, he analyzes what needs to be done. Um, athletic, um, and, and you know he won with his technique. Mm. And um, you know, again, he's just that group of guys that came through it was a uh, really an amazing group and, and also for the type of wrestling the wrestling that we did you know it was uh it was a neat thing yeah and that 1990 nationals is was your senior year and was the culmination of those of that Josie era title runs um now it's commonplace but talk about a true freshman winning the nationals back then how how often did that happen and the significance of it had it happened before a true freshman? 
maybe it did. I, yeah, it was, I, I don't know. Red shirt back. I don't know. I, well, you know, um, again, I will just go back to this. Pat Smith just didn't believe anybody could beat him. I think if he had thought about it, the, you know, there's some dudes out there that could have beat him. You know, because he didn't, he didn't have it all together his freshman year like he did, you know, as he progressed into his sophomore, junior, senior. I, you know, he got better and better and better. And, you know, if maybe if he would thought about it and it occurred to him <laughs> that somebody might be better, maybe he wouldn't have. But he didn't. He was like, I'm Pat Smith. I'm winning the Nationals. And that's it. You know, it's, it's really a, it's a cool thing. It's like for people who have self-doubt, which is the most of us, you know, and, don't, and get nervous for those big moments, you look at that and you're like, yeah, that's such a special thing that there's some people out there who have that. You have it. And the last thing I wanted to ask you about was just kind of describe – the winning your first NCAA title versus winning the Olympics and the kind of what those two represent to you. Okay. Yeah. Winning the NCAA title versus Olympics, winning the Olympics, but NCAA title for me, Ryan, I, um, that was validation for me. I didn't know for, you know, I, I had, you know, I didn't know for sure that I could, and I knew that there was a possibility that I wasn't going to, because you know there, uh, you know through the years you see a lot of guys. That tournament is hard to win, so you see a lot of guys that don't get up on the top of the podium at the NCAA's. Mm -hmm. Zeke Jones, Kevin Jackson, I mean, um, you know, and there are others. Um, so for me, winning that was it was validation. I, I think it got kind of the monkey off my back and allowed me to be Kendall Cross, NCAA champ. You know, versus Kendall Cross, eh, almost. And, you know, so winning that, to me, the winning the Civil A's, it gave me um, the ability to say to myself, I can win. I can win it all. I can win any time I want. or I w Not any time, but, you know, these, these stepping stones, these, these goals that I have. In the Olympics, um, having won the Civil A's, I think that was a huge part of me being able to tell myself I can win this. Mm. You know, I wasn't necessarily supposed to win the NCAAs and I won. I wasn't supposed to win the Olympics. I wasn't even supposed to make the team and I won. And I think I had a lot to do with um, when I'm laying in bed or driving my car or sitting around having a coffee and telling myself, dude, I can do this. Was there a lot of visualization in, in, your, in your daily practice back then? For sure. For sure. Not only in practice, man. Again, when I was driving, driving my car, or sitting, you know, like getting ready to go to bed, and I, I just remember um, there would be many times through the whole process of trying to make the Olympics um, gritting my teeth because I'm doing visualization, seeing myself win, you know, all that, you know, cheesy stuff that you hear. It's, yeah. It, it works. It's true, and it works. Amen. It does. And it's, it's good to hear someone like you talk about it. And I just got to say, uh, your role in that movie, Terry was phenomenal. I, uh, that's how I, be I became a fan. That's, that's an awesome documentary. Uh, I uh, rewatched it a couple, couple nights ago, getting ready for this. Awesome, man. That's, that's good to hear. Of course, you know, um, yeah, they, it turned out to be the crux of that documentary, you know, having, uh, my input. It was funny, you know, when the movie was, when I was hearing about it, being put together, I was like, oh, I can't wait to watch that. Uh, I, you know, I hadn't been a part of it yet because they came to me like at the 11th hour. Do you know that? What? They it looks like you're the focal point of the story arc. <laughs> yeah, I know. It wasn't this. Yeah, they were kind of, I think what happened is that they were like, I think we need to get Kendall's take on this. <laughs> yeah. And it was kind of one of the last things that they did was they came to me like literally the 11th hour um, before they were going to just sum it up and put a lid on it. And, um, Cause, Cause so before that, I was just, I was like, oh, I can't wait to see that. Cause I want to, if, if it's going to be about him, I'll get to understand and know what he was thinking through all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I wasn't, I didn't, wasn't a part of it. You know, I didn't plan to be a part of it, but then they came to me and said, Hey, we want your take. I was like, ah, oh, sweet. Okay. Heck yeah. Oh so, man. 
It was awesome. It was, it was great. Um, and this, you know, this interview here, just the same. It was, it was fantastic. I uh, really appreciate your time. I'll, I'll plan on releasing this in January. So we're not too far out. Um, don't have okay. too many, any left. Um, any last words on the Smiths or any final things we should have covered? You thought we, we didn't? No, I don't, I don't think so. No, I, you know, yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, with regard to the Smiths, it was just, I mean, such a cool thing to um, have gone through um, the times, gone through my wrestling with them, with them, Pat and John. Um, it was, it was really a, it was a special group of guys that were, that moved along and progressed with those guys. And we were all amazingly thankful for, you know, having that, um, having access to that, having access to greatness. Jeez, you know, what, what, what if I had, you know, what if I, by birthright, had gone through a little before or way before and, and not been exposed to John Smith or Pat Smith? What if you didn't but, move from Montana? Oh, I know, right? Crazy. That's like yeah. hard to think about. I, got, I will say the, the other thing I noticed was, man, your bracket, your true freshman, was it your true freshman year or your sophomore year when you wrestled Chertow, Penrith, and, make, and like, that was Dude. my true freshman year. Yeah, Drew Penrith. Yeah, yeah first Drew round. Penrith. Yeah, first round. I remember, if you have a minute, Leroy yeah. Smith told me at told me that morning in the hotel room. He was handing out brackets because that's what you do in 1986, 87, is you hand out brackets that have been printed out. Yeah. And um, um, he didn't hand me mine on purpose, and he said, "Hey, Kendall, I just um, hey, listen, I want to tell you, you got the number one seed." <laughs> and I thought he was joking. I was like, come on, Leroy. <laughs> Leroy was an assistant at the time. I was like, no, you, you, got, you got Penrith, number one, number one seed. I'm like, come on, who do I have? Who, how, no way. Who do I have? And he handed me my sheet, and there it was, man. Brad Penrith, first round. It's a bummer. Tight but, match, though. 10-9, 10-9. You know, they got into my head. They, they really did. say, like, Kendall, you can do this. He's not going to be thinking. Here's why. He's not going to be thinking about it. You, you, are, um, you are his worst nightmare style-wise. Dude, let's go get this. Let's go win this. They, so they had me, you know, Joe and Leroy and, um, you know, Bruce Burnett. They had me ready to go for that match thinking that I could win the match. I mean, I you're right there. And then Russell Back's chair time. I mean, just that whole weight was loaded, though. Um, I don't know much about Ricky Bonomo, I believe. Bonovo or Bonomo? Bonomo. Bonomo, but he's got a whole legacy as well. But it was just cool to see those old brackets and how stacked it was. Yes. Yeah. Loaded. Yeah. Good stuff, man. Well, Kendall Cross, thank you very much for your time, sir. I appreciate it. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text Wrestle to 555-888. That's Wrestle to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner as well as our website, wrestlingchangemylife.com. Take care, y'all.